go ahead and take it away. Okay, very good. Thanks, Matt. Welcome to Fridays with a Forester. My name is Gary Wyatt. I'll be the host today. Uh, I'm an extension educator with the University of Minnesota Extension uh, based on our Mankato Regional Office. Also managing the chat, we have Angela Gupta out of Rochester, our for my coworker in forestry extension. Also Matt Russell out of St. Paul, uh, also one of our teammates in forestry uh, in uh, St. Paul. Uh, today, we're going to have a uh, DNR Woodland Owner Assistance Talk by uh, Troy Hokum. Uh, and thank you, Troy, for joining us. Uh, he's a DNR uh, forester and uh, going to talk about what DNR foresters around the state of Minnesota can do with our Woodland Owner uh, Program. So our Zooms uh, will be uh, basically all muted and, uh, and we don't have a video for you, but you can enter your questions in chat and do that uh, anytime along the way. And we are recording this. We'll try and end at 10 o'clock uh, if we can. Uh, and if we have more questions, we can go past 10, that's fine. Uh, we do have all these recorded on a Z link, z.umn.edu slash Fridays. So you can go back and, and view the Fridays with a Forester that you've missed. Or if you wanna review this one, you certainly can. Troy, I'm gonna stop sharing and you can begin your presentation. Let me do this. And I'll close my screen there for that. Troy, it looks great. Yeah, full screen looks fantastic. Go ahead and begin. Okay, hi. Um, hi, everybody. Um, glad to be part of Fridays with the Forester. As Gary mentioned, my name is Troy Holcomb, and I'm a DNR forester uh, who works in Aiken, Minnesota, which is about the geographic center of Minnesota. Um, I work with private landowners in Aiken County. My job is to help landowners manage their woods well and achieve their goals for their property by helping them understand their woods better and connecting, connecting them to the tools and the resources that they need. So what are we going to talk about today? Um, I'm going to give some examples of ways that DNR foresters can help you manage your woods. We'll talk a little bit about uh, what things we can't do. Uh, I'll show you how you can find your DNR Forester. I have a few different places you can find some other sources of help, and I'm really hoping for a lot of questions, so um, just uh, ask away. So first off um, is a field visit. Um, a lot of people contact me, and they just, they just want a Forester to help them get started understanding their land. Um, and this is just an opportunity to take a walk with a forester in your woods. Um, we can give you some general direction and advice. A lot of people call about uh, like concerns with forest health. Sometimes they have um, <clears throat> concerns about a certain tree or certain areas of trees on their woods. Um, sometimes they have an idea for a project and they want help kind of scoping it out and seeing if they're realistic or, or how they should get started. Sometimes we might evaluate an area for the potential for harvest. Um, a note on field visits, there is no cost. You know, an average field visit uh, is maybe two to three hours long. Um, many of our foresters though are, are pretty busy and certain types of requests may not be able to be as addressed as quickly as others. <clears throat> During these field visits, um, the conversation pretty quickly turns to um, helping people plan to manage their property as a whole across their whole property and, and we talk about having a woodland stewardship plan or woodland management plan written for their property um, i love when landowners are interested in, in digging in and, and getting projects done but i find myself suggesting pretty often that the best place to start is getting a good comprehensive understanding of their land so the question might be why would i get a woodland management plan and an answer is, you know, I want to improve my woods, but I don't know where to begin. I need more ideas on how I can improve my woods. Um, and so the cost of owning my woodland is high and I would like to qualify for a tax incentive so I can keep it. Uh, this is what the cover of a woodland stewardship uh, plan book looks like and some specifics on this program. You, you need to have 20 acres of non-agricultural land, non-developed land to qualify to receive a woodland stewardship plan. 
Woodland stewardship plans have a 10 year lifespan. The reason for that is that even though sometimes it looks like our woods aren't changing, um, they really are changing. It's just kind of so slow that maybe sometimes we don't notice it. And so we want people to have an opportunity to take a new look at their land every 10 years, receive some new advice and have some contact with the forester. Um, woodland stewardship plans need to be written by a DNR approved plan writer. And what does that mean? A DNR approved plan writer is required to have a natural resources degree and meet yearly continuing education credit requirements. Um, a professional forester walks your land with you and develops management recommendations based on your goals and objectives and then the resources that you have on your land, the types of trees, the types of wetlands, things like that. Uh, the plans are reviewed by DNR foresters like me against a set of standards to make sure that all landowners are receiving the same quality product. Uh, the plan would then qualify a landowner for one of two tax incentive programs that we'll talk about here in a minute. Um, in fact, across Minnesota, most woodland stewardship plans are written by private forestry consultants. Uh, DNR foresters also write plans. We have a lot of other job duties uh, on the side. Um, so it ends up being private forestry consultants that write most of the plans and, and they're, they're all pretty nice plans. If the DNR were to write you a, a woodland stewardship plan, our fee is a $300 base fee plus $7 an acre. This is an example of uh, like what a map would look like that would come with your woodland stewardship plan. Your land is broken down by similar cover types. And then for each of those areas, based on what type of woods or fields or wetlands are, are in that area, uh, management recommendations are developed for each of those cover types. So if you wanna learn more about um, <coughs> woodland stewardship plans, all you have to do is Google MN Forest Stewardship. And we have quite a bit of information on our website to help get you started. Uh, one of my favorite parts of a woodland stewardship plan is how it helps landowners understand not just their own woods, but the woods around them. Um, in Minnesota, we've broken down the forest types across the state into a hierarchical classification system to better understand the natural processes that the forest have, have evolved from. And understanding these different types of woods and how they developed, um, it, it helps us better manage our current forest by working with nature rather than, than against it. So what I'm trying to say is, how does your woods fit into the larger landscape around you. You can't just consider your 40 or 80. You have to look at the forest around you. So this um, e ecological classification system is what we call it. it. It uses historical vegetation records and the types of glacial landforms that your property is on, the soils in your location and, and local weather conditions that all has an impact on how your forest developed and how it's gonna continue to develop. So. Um, the Woodland Stewardship Plans have information about that as well, which I, I think is pretty neat. I mentioned tax incentive programs. Um, the most popular one in Aiken County, where I work, is called the Sustainable Forest Incentives Act, or SFIA. And this provides incentive payments um, to landowners to encourage sustainable use of forest lands. Um, because private land provides benefits that all citizens realize, I think of like water quality, uh, wildlife habitat, deer don't stay just on one property, you know, a raindrop that falls in Aiken County and ends up in the Mississippi and, and flows through the Twin Cities. The legislator created several different incentive programs to promote sustainable forest management. So once you have your woodland stewardship plan, you're eligible to go into one of these two tax incentive programs. So um, the SFIA program um, pays actually a per acre per year payment. The minimum commitment is eight years and um, you can go up to a 50 year commitment with correspondingly higher payment rates. So um, a lot of people in Aiken County enroll into SFIA. In other areas where property taxes are maybe a little bit higher, uh, people choose to enroll in the 2C managed forest land tax classification. And what that does is it reduces your tax rate to 0.65%. I, 
I encourage people to check with their county assessor if they're considering um, <clears throat> enrolling in 2C. Sometimes, depending on what your tax class rate is now, your property taxes could actually go up. Um, 2C is just a year to year program. There's a much shorter time commitment than SFIA, but both of these programs require having a woodland stewardship plan. Um, the next step, once people have their woodland stewardship plan, I encourage them to read through it and pick out one to several projects that kind of get them excited. And then a DNR forester could help you take that next step. So um, why would I seek assistance for a woodland project? You, know, you have your plan and you want to start implementing it, basically. You want to do a project, you have something in mind, and you want financial help to do it. We can help you with that. You have maybe have an idea for a project, but don't know the best way to get started or how to complete it. Um, project planning assistance um, is no fee. We can walk your land with you and help you figure out how to get started on a, on a project. And I wanna give you a few examples. So this land, landowner here uh, wanted to improve their wildlife habitat. Um, you can see these white spruce trees we're planning to provide protection from winter weather for wildlife, which is the limiting factor for most species of wildlife in Minnesota that, uh, that don't migrate, I guess. Um, they planted oak seedlings, and then they placed these tubes around them to prevent deer browse. And you can actually see they sprayed strips here. They used herbicide to kill this grass so that um, they could reduce that grass competition on the oak seedlings. So this is a really great example of a, a kind of a multi-pronged approach to improve wildlife habitat. Other great project ideas, invasive species control. This, uh, this is a project where uh, a woodland was <coughs> infested with buckthorn really thickly and you couldn't even get in there to treat it with herbicide. So we mowed it all down and let it uh, re-sprout and then sprayed those sprouts. Um, browse protection from deer on white pine. This is an example here of, of bud capping, where paper is stapled over the terminal bud of the white pine to prevent uh, browsing. Um, you could prune your white pine to reduce the chance of white pine blister rust infection. You could hang some wood duck boxes. Um, stream bank stabilization is, is another project that, that people have done. And then this is an example of a disc trencher uh, working in a recently harvested area to prepare the site for tree planting. <clears throat> I mentioned cost share assistance, along with uh, helping you plan out your project, DNR Forestry has a cost share program that we launched in 2016. It's available to cover an incredible variety of projects, uh, including the ones we just looked at. Um, Woodland Stewardship Plan is not required to access our cost share program. A professional forester is going to prepare the plan for you. There's no minimum acreage. And our goal is to reimburse you roughly 50% of the cost to purchase some materials and install the project. You get reimbursed after all the work is complete. Uh, so again, just our timeline. You would contact me or, or one of my colleagues, discuss what you're thinking of doing. Uh, we'd come out and walk your land, mark out the project area, and help you lay out the steps from start to finish. We would write up a project plan and then help you get the cost share funds set aside and they'd be sitting there waiting for you to, to complete the project. I kind of like this picture. Uh, I helped this landowner. He had a hay field that he didn't want to hay anymore and um, he wanted to plant trees in it. So uh, in September, he sprayed strips in his hay field. And then in May of the next year, he planted uh, these seedlings using a, a machine planter hooked to the back of his tractor in those strips. And that was about four years ago now, and, and the trees are growing great. And I'm going to kind of take a little side trip here and, and talk about something I'm passionate about, and that's the value of site prep. Um, it's important when you're planting trees um, to give them what they need. Um, I can't overstate the value of site prep when you're planting trees. We saw that herbicide example in the picture here, um, the, the tree planting machine 
uh, had scalper attachments on it, which is just a basically a one bottom plow. And it flips that sod over and it creates a nice competition free zone for those trees to be planted in. Um, so there's chemical, mechanical site prep are, are the two common methods. Uh, if you're thinking of planting fields with bare soil, I think putting in an annual crop the season before can help you eat up the, the seed bank of all those weeds that are, that are on the ground. So this is a sample project plan. This is what it would look like as a map, contact information, description of the site and the, the description of the steps. So you, you'd have a reference then to, to go back and, um, and, and read through as you're completing your project. So if you wanna learn more about this, you can give me a call or just Google MNDNR financial assistance. Um, one of the most common calls I get, especially this time of year, is where to find trees and shrubs. And I do have a list, we all have a list of um, nurseries that sell seedlings to Minnesota private landowners. So uh, any DNR forester can share that with you. Planting trees and shrubs is a great way to make a big improvement and feel a sense of accomplishment. But unfortunately, we get a lot of calls from people that want to buy trees in the spring. And at that point, it's already too late. The, met, the best time to make plans to plant trees is, is frankly in like August or September. Uh, of the spring before you want to plant. This will give you time to complete site prep and sign up for cost share. And nurseries typically start selling their seedlings in November and they sell out pretty quickly. So um, just want people to avoid that pitfall and, and, and plan ahead. One of our uh, project examples there was invasive species control. Of all the projects I recommend to landowners, learning to identify and control invasive species on your property is the most important, frankly. Um, invasive species didn't evolve, didn't evolve with our forest ecosystems, and they have the ability to outcompete our native vegetation. Um, it poses a large risk to the ability of our woods to produce quality wildlife habitat, timber products, water quality, and recreational opportunities. So um, these are the, a few of the public enemy number one that I think are, are a big risk to our forested ecosystems. Buckthorn, uh, knapweed, spotted knapweed, garlic mustard, oriental bittersweet. So um, it might not be the first thing people think of when they wanna do things to their woods, but um, I think it's the most important. A DNR forester can also help you with timber sale assistance. Uh, harvesting timber can be a great tool for keeping your trees healthy and creating or enhancing habitat, but it's really important to do it right. There's a right way and a wrong way, and the best way to get started with a timber harvest is to have a forester on your team. It doesn't have to be a DNR forester, it can be a consultant, but um, this, is, this is a service that DNR foresters can provide to private woodland owners. So what we would do is help you appraise your timber, paint the boundaries, um, we can help you send out bid announcements to buyers. Um, so we're, we're helping you figure out what to cut and where and quantify the, the volumes and values of, of those trees. Um, we can't help you really administer the sale. Once the harvesting begins, we can provide some advice, but we can't act as your agent like a consultant can. The DNR is gonna charge a service fee of 13% of the value of your sale and consultants do the same. Their fee is, can be more variable or negotiated, but DNR, our fee is just 13%. Um, so yeah, I encourage people to um, take the assistance of a forester if they think they're gonna harvest some timber. So here's some things that a DNR forester can't do for you. We can't, as I said, act as your agent or act on your behalf. Um, we worked for the DNR, and that's, that's who pays us. So we, um, we can't um, act as an agent for a landowner. We can't really recommend specific service providers or loggers. We can give you a list of them and um, help you work through the process, but we can't recommend any, anyone specific. We don't do timber appraisals for land purchase or sale, um, trespassing disputes or like weather damage, things like that. 
And we don't do land surveying or property line marking unless it's associated with a specific project or timber sale. <clears throat> so how can you find us? On our website, we have an interactive map and all you have to do is Google MNDNR Forest Stewardship and this map comes up. And you can click on each of these colored areas and our contact, our name and contact info uh, would show up. So depending on where your land is, um, you would just click on, on one of those colored areas and, and you could give us a call. Uh, where else can you get help? If you haven't checked out the Minnesota Forestry Association, I encourage you to. Uh, it's a great place to learn about educational opportunities, field workshops, and connect with other landowners that are just like you. Um, they also have this really neat call before you cut program, which is modeled after like the Gopher State one call. So if you think you're gonna harvest some timber or you're thinking you, you wanna consider it, um, you can call that number or even go on their website and they send you a free no obligation packet of information that can help you get started with that process. So if you're looking for a simple timber sale contract or professional forester contacts or logger contacts. Um, that's a great way to get started. MFA puts out a newsletter and they do host workshops throughout the year. So it's a great way to kind of um, meet other landowners like you. If you think you might like to work with a consulting forester there, they have a really nice website. There's an association of consulting foresters. As I mentioned, they write stewardship plans uh, help people with timber sales um, and can act a little bit more strongly on your on your behalf. Uh, and so that's what I had to share today. And uh, I'm, I'm open to any questions people might have. Right. Do you want to stop sharing? Uh, I've got your information on my screen too, as well. So I'm going to start sharing. Uh, let's see. Yes. And yes, if you have questions, uh, please put them in the chat. And let's see. So while Gary's getting things ready, um, I asked everyone if you would to add your name and maybe where your property is and any questions you have for Troy in the chat. Um, but I'll kick it off and say, Troy, I, it's a two-part question. Um, what do you think is the most common reason people find you initially? And what would be the thing you would want most landowners to think about early? Mm, that's, those are good questions, Angie. Most people call me, um, a lot of the private land in Aiken County is owned by people that maybe don't live in Aiken County. Um, and they usually own their land for uh, being able to get out of the cities, come up north and ride their four wheeler and be able to go hunting and spend time with their family. So a lot of people want, are managing or want to manage their property for those goals. How can they make their hunting better? And, um, and so that's usually how our conversation begins. So, um, so to that end, I generally encourage people, you know, off the bat, to, to start thinking about A, controlling invasive species and B, um, planting some trees. And um, because like I mentioned, most wildlife, you know, the limiting factor for them is winter weather, whether it's grouse or deer. And so I've been really pushing hard for people to plant thermal cover like balsam fir and white spruce um, to, to help provide better winter habitat for those species, because that seems to be what most people are, are interested in. So like they say that the, the best time to plant a tree was yesterday and the second best time is today. So um, those are the conversations I typically have with, with people. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. And Gary, I, I see a question in the chat. Are you you're going to read that? Yeah, sure. Uh, from Beth, uh, if you, if I understand correctly, with plan with the plan that you talked about, can the plan can get help in consult controlling uh, garlic mustard? And this is Beth from Dodge County. Yeah. So in the, and I think I understand the question there. 
by getting a woodland stewardship plan, can they get help controlling garlic mustard? Is that how you understand think, it, Gary? I think so. Yeah, um, that's a great first step because you're, you're going to have a forester there on your property with you. They can help you identify the areas where the garlic mustard is present. And then as part of that comprehensive plan, they can provide you some recommendations and say, in this area, you can control garlic mustard by doing A, B, and C things. And then the next step would be, um, you know, that forester could write you a project plan and the DNR forester could sign you up for cost share to do those um, practices. Do, do you think that answers the question, Gary? I think so. Oh, we got another one from Carol, I think. Carol, thank you. Hello, this is Carol uh, here from Northern Anoka County. And my partner and I are working on increasing and plant, the plant tree diversity on our 20 acre, more than 20 acres, or approximately a 20 acre place. Uh, we are currently working on our wet meadow. Uh, would you, or would black spruce be the tree to plant to increase winter cover in uh, the slightly higher ground, in slightly higher ground? So, so they want to, Black, okay, so they're working spruce. on a wet meadow, but they're going to plant some trees on higher ground. Is that? Yes, I believe so. Okay. Black spruce. Um, black spruce is generally associated with, um, you know, forested wetlands, although it, it can grow on, on drier soils. It probably isn't the best suited tree for a, a drier soil. It'd be a tree to plant on kind of the edges of that wetland, maybe. Where, where the soil stays statu saturated for a, a longer period of time. Um, probably red pine would be good for those, those drier areas, although you, you would have to protect it from um, deer browse. And I always like white spruce. That's a, that's a great tree. It's low maintenance. And, and those, she adds, so it, it would still be in the wet meadow, but on higher ground. Okay. Yeah, then then black spruce would probably some be something interesting to try. Just just know that you know try to place those trees in areas where the soil stays a little bit wetter for for a longer period of the growing season. And Carol, I, just another comment. Uh, Troy, would you recommend to Carol that maybe we want, she want to plant more than one species of tree, and maybe uh, I don't know if any deciduous trees would be either swamp swamp white oak or something or but maybe some pines and intermixed with some pines and spruce uh, in area area. Yeah, absolutely, Gary. Yeah, diversity is the key. Um, and not putting all your eggs in one basket it really helps make your project more of a success. Yep. Um, swamp white oak would be really fun. Even some tamarack, mm -hmm. although tamarack doesn't really provide you with that winter thermal cover. It is a tree that's, that's suited to the, the this description that she's giving us there. Um, yeah, I would, I would encourage her to have a forester kind of come walk around and, and, uh, and help her pick out a list of maybe five to 10 different species of trees that, that she could plant in that specific area. Okay. And she comments, uh, we will be planting some white pines and deciduous trees as well, as, or as well but, <coughs> but wasn't thinking about the spruce. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I will place a call. Yeah, yep. Thanks, Carol. Carol could Carol could call my friend Maddie there at uh, who works at Carlos Avery and she could come over and, and help her with that. So here's Rich from Zambrota Falls, Wabashaw County, 125 acres, about 80 hardwood with buckthorn, garlic mustard, and emerald ash borer infestations. Man, can we come and visit you uh, there, Rich? Uh, you've got it all um, <laughs> to yeah. continue. Uh, also, uh, have a small bluff prairie ecosystem uh, here in Lake. Uh, uh, Zumbro, and uh, that probably should be burned, uh, but I'm not sure how would how would how or who would help with that, uh, with mm -hmm. regard to buckthorn feels like losing battle, uh, mm -hmm. especially since neighboring woods are almost unmanaged and infested. I'm only 20 miles out of Rochester. Uh, best to contact that, that office. Uh, it uh, let's see, it uh, looks like I'm actually in a different region based upon your map. Uh, please, any comments for Rich? Yeah, okay, well, <laughs> we can address all those questions, Gary, make sure we don't miss one though. Okay. Um, yeah, definitely 
in terms of the invasive species, it can feel super overwhelming. And so I encourage people to just take small bites and small chunks and just work on that and then move to the next section. It's unrealistic to think you can eradicate all of the invasive species within a whole woodlot. Um, it just, it is, it becomes overwhelming. I'm, I'm starting to change my perspective on that, on invasive species control. Um, doing anything is better than doing nothing. And um, any type of control on invasive species is gonna allow some type of native plant to stay on the site, which, which is a good thing. Um, so yes, Zumbro Falls is a little bit out of my wheelhouse. I'd encourage him to call Val Green down in uh, Caledonia, and she could put Bruce in touch with maybe some contractors, or uh, one of our foresters could come write him a project plan and say, you know, do A, B, and C. Start here, do this, do this, this time of year. And, um, you know, Bruce is just one guy, so let's do it the right way and, and not waste his time and energy. Um, and we would have cost share for those practices, you know, to help reimburse him for the, the chemicals and the, the time that, that he would put into it. Um, as far as his prairie goes, um, yeah, those, those can benefit from some burning from time to time, depending on what's present on the site. We do have cost share for that. Assistance is a little bit harder to get. The DNR doesn't help landowners with, with private burns, but um, with Val's local knowledge, she could maybe put Bruce in touch with a contractor that could help him accomplish that, or at least um, help him understand what it takes to successfully complete a prescribed burn safely. Mm -hmm. And Rich, I don't know if you have a plan already, a woodland stewardship plan, but uh, the DNR has some cost share opportunities for all those practices, Troy? Yes, sir. Yep. Invasive species control, prescribed burning. Yep. Absolutely. You know, if, if, if Bruce was able to clear an area of invasives and he wanted to replace uh, or install some native vegetation, some shrubs and trees in those areas, we could cost share that as well. Thank you, Rich, for your questions and comments. Uh, Angie put a post in there. Angie, you want to comment on that? Uh, sure. So um, I dropped in a couple of links. Um, the one is for this invasive plant control, and that is uh, essentially a way to think about where to prioritize your invasive species, recognizing that most woodland owners have multiple invasive species. And um, let's say buckthorn and garlic muster and honeysuckle are on the same site, and, and there could be many more. Um, but the infestation of each of those may be different. And um, it, it is important to know sort of where to start uh, so you can actually make a difference. So for example, um, a targeting island population. So if you just have a little bit of garlic mustard in one corner, make sure you get that one first and then slowly work towards the major infestation. Um, if you can't actually get to it, but you can at least get rid of the seeds, that's very beneficial. Um, even if you, you don't actually get to removal Similarly for garlic or for buckthorn, same kind of idea, right? If there's an area of your property that has fewer of it, go after that area first. If you can go after the females, the berry producing first, um, do that. And so at least you start taking out the seed producers of the landscape and you can go back and get the males. Uh, there's lots of different ways to approach that. It occurs to me now, I'll drop in one other uh, invasive plant control database, and that has lots of great resources to think about how to, to control invasive species. Uh, and I think it's important to recognize this is a long-term investment of resources and time and your approach to management will vary as you go down that journey, right? So, you know, the first year might be tackling um, the, the female buckthorns on the edge of your woodlot, right? And then you might slowly work in and then eventually you might have all of the big buckthorn down and now you're looking at managing the, the understory and you might have a very different approach to that. And so I'll drop in that link and, and hopefully that will be helpful. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Angie. And both, both Troy and Angie mentioned start small. And uh, even when I talk to homeowners, I, I say rope off an area, you know, even 20 by 20 or whatever big mm -hmm. size you want and rope it off with tape or rope uh, or caution tape and then start in. But uh, yeah, if you just start in without any type of boundaries, uh, you're, you're going to get fed up with the practice and, and it's going to be futile and <coughs> You're just going to throw your hands up and you leave and, and not touch it again. So uh, it, it's little bites at a time and, and just uh, pace yourself. 
on invasive species. And maybe to piggyback on that, I like Gary's idea of just like um, roping off an area. I think it's also super important and um, and the prioritized invasive plants talk about this is taking before and after pictures. Mm -hmm. it, it can be really demoralizing, but if you can go back and look at those before pictures and really see that change, you really, I think it becomes easier to realize that you are indeed making change, right? And so whether it's, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I uh, when I go out there and work in the woods, I take a picture when I start um, and then a couple hours later when I'm done for the day, right? And I'll take another picture and, and the change can be quite noticeable. And then I've been able to go back and look at the next year, right? So I move, removed a bunch of honeythorn and honeysuck, honeysuckle and buckthorn in a woodlot. And then the following spring, tons of bluebells came up. And so it was such a moment of gratification. I will actually share it in the chat. Um, but like, if I hadn't taken the before picture, I couldn't share the after picture. And both give me a great deal of, of pleasure and motivation. And I went out many times to go admire the bluebells this spring. So again, um, those pictures can really be motivational. Yes, very cool. Uh, Troy, I wanted to ask a question about goats or livestock uh, uh, and invasive species. Does the DNR uh, uh, cost share programs help with that? That's a good question, Gary. I've never helped anyone with that. Okay. Um, I can look that up. Sure. And while you're looking that up, I know the you might want to check with your Natural Resource Conservation Service. I did put in the chat mm -hmm. that the Soil Water Conservation District offices in every county um, may not offer a tree sales program in every county, but certainly neighboring counties might. And that's a great opportunity to buy trees, too, in your local area. Uh, and they're usually re really reasonable not to take from any local nurseries, but certainly if you wanna plant multiple uh, species and, and numerous of, uh, numbers of them, uh, they usually sell, sell in bundles of 25 uh, bare roots in the, in the spring, but you do have to get your orders in January, February in most counties to, to make their order. Um, but do check with Soil Water Conservation District. Also the Natural Resource Conservation Service may have, have equipped dollars, that's federal dollars, uh, uh, that's NRCS office. Usually SWCD and NRCS offices are in the same location in each county, and they might have some, some equipped dollars that are available for farmers or landowners that have woodlands that can control invasive species and, and uh, buckthorn control. So that might be a possibility as well. Yeah, those are also great options in, in terms of assistance and cost share, Gary. I've, I've found with some landowners that the the plethora of resources can be actually one of the barriers to success. There's, there's a lot of great things out there, but knowing where to find it and what one is the right resource for you can be difficult. Um, you mentioned equip dollars through NRCS. Their payment rates are actually pretty good on their cost share, but their enrollment, it, they have one deadline a year and then you have to wait and your project is ranked and scored. Um, DNR Forestry's cost share, you can apply for cost share and be approved 10 days later and be working on your project. And so we're a little bit more Great. flexible and, and adaptable. Um, we do cost share animal control for invasive species. It's a per acre rate. So for example, if you have a light infestation and you wanted to use goats or live, livestock to control it, we could pay you $150 an acre to do that. Wow. Um, and I know that's a popular thing and it's kind of a fun idea to have goats eat your buckthorn and not have to go out there and cut it and spray it but what you need to consider is it's a non-selective practice so those goats are going to eat everything else that's there too so you need to be okay with that you know if you have some species that you want to preserve that might be a hard thing to do so good point very good point and, and if you want some species to be preserved you better fence them off uh, with maybe cattle fencing almost five foot fencing and and very stable because they like to climb too. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, good, good comments. Any more questions we have for Troy today? Please enter them in chat. I'm happy to take calls later or emails to Gary. Doesn't matter if, if you're in my work area or not. Um, okay. We can get people connected to where they need to go. Great. And Troy's contact information is on the screen there, I believe. He's out of Aiken. Mm -hmm. We appreciate his time today sharing uh, what the benefits of DNR foresters are to our landowners in Minnesota and woodland owners. We'll kind of hold on for a little bit longer. 
Well, Richard says, uh, thank you very much for your time and information. Thank you, Richard, for joining us today. Uh, hang on for a little bit. There's ditto for Carol. Yes, uh, our, our Minnesota DNR foresters are a very valuable resource in Minnesota. So certainly um, tap into that resource. No pun intended, maple syrup wife. Oh, you get a lot of thank yous in the chat now. Uh, thank you, Troy. Good program, great presentation, Troy. Oh, Kirsten. Kristen, good to see you. Any other final questions? I'm gonna run through the final slides here real quickly. Um, and we've got one more Fridays with a Forester coming up and that's gonna be June 10th, Family Earth Care with Angie, Angela Gupta from Rochester. And uh, that'll be our last one for the season. Uh, there'll be an evaluation following the Zoom here. Uh, so if you could fill that out and uh, put in any uh, other comments uh, for future Fridays with a Forester topics and speakers that you'd like to see. And uh, again, if you want more information, we have uh, my, my Minnesota Woods through extension, through that Z link, and there's an email through my Minnesota Woods and also our recordings of all of our Fridays with a Forester, again, at the Z link, z.umn.edu slash Fridays. So we thank you for attending today. And uh, we look forward to uh, maybe hosting these for next year. We'll see, 2023. And join us for June 10th uh, for our final uh, meeting this, this year. Thanks for joining us.